um, and explain some of the uh, some of the trends that we see. So, <clears throat> in this uh, plot, uh, so what I'm showing is on the x-axis, this is um, log of the density around the local density around these halos, um, normalized by the average density in the simulation. Uh, on the y on the y-axis are several halo properties, so uh, NFW concentration, uh, spin parameter, and then the specific um, dynamically time average specific mass accretion rate here on the bottom. But <clears throat> um, so there's four different uh, mass bins here, the four columns uh, ranging from a halo mass of about 11, 10 to the 11.2, 10 to the 12, and so on. And so I'm going to focus on the lowest mass bin here and point out a couple of these uh, trends that we observed. One more thing to mention as well is that the different uh, lines shown here um, are correspond to different smoothing scales um, for the density. Um, so when, uh, met, when taking densities uh, smoothed on, say, one megaparsec, which is the blue line here, would be this one. Um, this is the median of the relation between concentration and density uh, you know, for the halos in this mass bin. So, um, so the thing to note is that <clears throat> we see that the concentration reaches a minimum. This is somewhere around approximately median density. And in low density regions, it increases 30-ish um, percent. Um, it, of course, does as well in high density regions. And this is not as surprising, um, but I'll also talk a bit more about that in a, in a little bit later. Um, and we see uh, similarly in the opposite direction that um, compared to approximately sort of average or median density regions, when we get to low density regions, these halos, ha these halos tend to have significantly lower spin parameters. Again, something like a 30% decrease. So uh, expanding on this a little bit with a, a, and a looking at it in a, a different way. So this, um, this plot is showing the evolution of halos on the <clears throat> x-axis. So this is uh, log scaling of 1 plus redshift. Um, and then the halo properties on the y-axis here are tidal force, spin parameter, uh, mass, and um, uh, mass accretion rate. Um, and so, uh, so what, what I've done here is to select halo, groups of halos at redshift zero. Um, the blue line is halos that are in high density regions at redshift zero. Uh, black is median and red is uh, low density regions. And then following the progenitors of these halos back in time and looking at the median values of their halo properties um, is, you know, we're plotting uh, how, how these change, uh, you know, with redshift. And so what we see is, again, focusing on that lowest mass bin, um, a couple of interesting things. One is that for halos that are in low density regions at redshift zero, they have <clears throat> lower tidal force. But this is um, consistently the case if we follow these halos back in time, comparing them to um, the other groups from redshift zero. Um, so halos in low um, density regions have always had lower tidal forces, um, at least when we're looking at medians here, um, compared to halos in median density regions. Uh, and similarly, they have lower spin parameters, as we saw in the previous slide. Um, but this also is something that has consistently been the case. Um, we can see that this is actually not the case um, with halos in high density regions. which is uh, represented by the blue line here, because these, while they have um, lower spin parameters at redshift zero, uh, as we can see uh, here, um, they, uh, this is only something that's developed recently. And if we go back to about redshift one, they're more consistent with um, halos for median density regions. So the, the point here is that halos in low density regions at redshift zero uh, have always had lower spin parameters and have experienced lower tidal forces. Um, and so the um, explanation that we have for this is just that um, <clears throat> they, these halos didn't have as many neighbors to, um, to, to torque them up throughout their formation and evolution. And um, so one of the questions that this, um, that this uh, 
we can ask um, uh, from this is, um, what does this say about uh, whether spin parameter, um, the, the connection between halo spin parameter and galaxy size? So there's been uh, some some papers that you know have suggested a, a connection here that that halo spin parameter is um, is a way is connected uh, is a predictor for for galaxy size, and so this is something um, that would if this were true, that the spin parameters were lower in low density regions, this would suggest a corresponding um, a uh, corresponding decrease in the galaxy size uh, for halos in these low density regions. And so this is something that we're working on on checking as well um, with uh, undergraduate student uh, Graham Famitoisen um, by now computing densities using observer-centric methods of computing density, like nth nearest neighbor um, counting galaxies within different size apertures and so on, and um, checking to see whether these trends hold in, uh, using those methods of density um, calculation or estimation, <clears throat> and then um, using abundance matching to, uh, to check directly whether uh, galaxy size um, is uh, related to uh, the spin parameter for low density halos and galaxies in low density regions. Um, pre the preliminary results for this indicate that uh, it's, it's not, um, it does not uh, appear to be the case that uh, galaxies are not smaller in low density regions. Um, so there must be, uh, so that <clears throat> halo spin parameter would not be a, a good predictor of galaxy size, at least uh, for these halos. But there are some other um, predictors that uh, we're checking as well, <clears throat> such as uh, concentration-based estimator um, suggested by Feng Zhu Zhang. And uh, so just to give a, a quick um, uh, uh, plot of, of some, some of the observer-centric um, densities. So this is recently produced uh, by Graham. And we just see here that this is, um, this is what I um, showed in the previous slide. This is uh, the way that we've computed density by sort of the true density by counting dark matter particles. Um, these trends show the density computed using uh, by uh, counting galaxies in different um, size apertures. So this is like more similar to what observers would do, uh, as well as um, and this is for different sized apertures, the different uh, lines, and then for the nth nearest neighbor is the, the darker solid line here. So the point is that we see similar trends. <clears throat> the scaling is a little bit different on the axis, but uh, sorry, we still see that uh, spin parameters uh, are decreasing in low density regions. Okay, so that's kind of uh, what I was going to say about, about um, the density dependence of halo properties. So uh, now I'm going to switch over to talking about um, halo mass loss and um, sort of the causes and consequences of halo mass loss, um, what causes it and what implications it has for other halo properties. Um, and just to introduce the subject, um, uh, an obvious question is, how common is mass loss? Um, and it is surprisingly common, uh, at least, uh, you know, using the 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 catalogs for the simulation that we're looking at and everything, uh, what we see is that um, looking at the, the the smallest mass spin that I've been referring to so far, which is uh, 10 to the um, 11.2 uh, solar masses for halo mass, um, we see that about um, so this 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 plot is showing the percent mass loss, and what I mean by that is that at redshift zero, uh, the virial radius of the halo compared to whatever the maximum mass, the peak mass of that halo was. Um, if the virial, if the redshift zero mass is say 90% of the, the, the peak mass that it had during its evolution, then this would be uh, percent mass loss is 10% here. So this is the, the, the cumulative dist distribution function of uh, mass loss for halos um, in this particular mass bin. And so we see that if we look at the 5% level about 22% or so of halos have lost more than 5% um, of their uh, relative to their peak mass. Um, and for uh, higher mass halos, it's, it's less significant. But 
Um, but this is a this is a lot of payloads if we're um, if we're investigating uh, what is going on with this this group of nearly a quarter of low mass halos and and still a significant fraction of, of higher mass halos. Um, this this gives us uh, enough to get some some good statistics. Um, so uh, next obvious question is why why is this happening? Um, and we've divided it into two main causes and four, uh, four groups, um, those being the most dominant, which is uh, lab we'll labeled as relaxation. This is um, something that uh, is following a, a merger. So and specifically in this particular case, a major merger. Um, this is mass loss that, fo that follows uh, a merger. So that's what this relaxation group is referring to. <clears throat> And then the other main cause uh, is uh, tidal stripping. So um, that's the the, the red uh, portion here. Um, in some cases, we can't really distinguish between these two. So that would be these halos would get uh, lumped into the both. And then we have neither, which is halos that lose mass, but we can't uh, clearly see whether that was as a result of following a major merger or uh, due to tidal stripping. Uh, although I'll just say that most likely the neither, we're pretty sure at this point that the neither group as a result of uh, minor mergers, um, which is just not something that we have uh, readily uh, tagged in the, in the catalogs, so not something that we can um, easily uh, check, but, but, uh, but, but this is what's going on here most likely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll uh, I'll talk some more about that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, but first I'll just say um, what is what happens to. Well, I'll address part at least of what what's happening um, to the halos when uh, as a result of the mass loss. First, just by looking at um, some correlation with uh, uh, this relation uh, against the spin parameter. Um, so again, with the amount, the, the uh, degree of mass loss on the bottom, now just looking at um, the spin parameter on the y-axis, we see that <clears throat> for halos that have not last, lost any mass, so this would, would be sort of a normal halo on the far right, um, compared to halos that have lost at least a small amount of mass, these halos have uh, a higher spin parameter, and as we go to more significant mass loss, uh, much lower spin parameters. So what's going on here is that um, there are uh, these, this um, regime of mass loss in the, about 5 to 15 to 20 ish percent of mass loss is uh, dominated by uh, these cases of um, the uh, merger related um, uh, scenario of mass loss, whereas the subsequent um, regime is dominated by the tidal stripping um, scenario. And this is just saying that most of the time, any mass loss following a major merger is going to be limited to a relatively small amount, while um, the tidal stripping, which is much less common, um, can result in much more significant uh, amount of mass loss. <clears throat> so, well, and then for higher uh, mass halos, we don't see so much tidal stripping. It's mostly just uh, uh, major mer merger-related um, mass loss. So. Um, I'll show a couple of examples um, of what this looks like for individual halos and we we'll get some more details. So um, what I'm plotting here is the evolution of the halo properties for one individual halo um, over time. So redshift, uh, one plus redshift on the x-axis, and then we have mass, virial radius, maximum circular velocity, scale radius, spin parameter, prolateness, so shape, <coughs> um, tidal force, X off is a measure of asymmetry, which is basically the difference between the um, center of mass of the halo and the highest density point, and then the virial ratio. So this particular halo experiences a major merger right here. Um, and already we can see how that major merger correlates uh, with some of the other halo properties. But um, uh, so the mass loss is this portion right here. So the merger happens right here. Of course, the mass increases dramatically 
and then it falls off a bit before beginning to increase again before uh, positive uh, uh, accretion. And <clears throat> so we can see that the, the, the main trends that uh, we associate with this uh, merger and subsequent mass loss process, which by the way, this is chosen because it is uh, a very typical uh, version of, of what happens, sequence of events. So this is not sort of unusual to this particular halo, but this is quite typical. Um, so we see that the scale radius uh, peaks strongly, um, as well as the, the prolateness and XOF and uh, the, these and spin parameter and burial ratio coincident with the merger. Um, <clears throat> and then it subsequently, uh, in some cases, like with scale radius, prolateness, they tend to oscillate one or two times before settling down. But during this mass loss um, period, the scale radius, for example, is still elevated relative to before that merger. And so that is the, uh, the trend that we see. Halos that have lost some amount of mass have higher scale radius, higher spin parameter, um, more elongated, so higher prolateness, and um, they are more, uh, well, not so much in this case, but typically uh, higher asymmetry and, and burial ratio. <clears throat> so now looking at some more detail, um, this is the same halo, but now showing uh, some, some way of showing the, the distribution of the particles. And so the way that this is shown here is with, uh, these are the, the, the particles for this halo. On the y-axis is the magnitude of the radial vector of each particle. And the, the, the y-axis is the velocity vector. Um, so, uh, so overlaid are the scale radius, burial radius, uh, maximum circular velocity, um, as well as on the bottom, this is a scaled version of the density profile. Um, so it's scaled by r cubed, uh, and it's colored according to the slope of the um, log. Uh, it's, it's colored according to the, the slope of the radius uh, density uh, relation. So um, it, basically, uh, for an NFW halo, the inner uh, region of the halo would normally be about uh, r to the minus 1, which would be like a blue color. So this would be uh, like you know, for a normal NFW halo would be sort of bluish here, uh, minus one would be approximately minus two here, and then uh, would be about flat on this, this part of the uh, profile in this minus three. Okay, so what I'll do then is um, I'm gonna play an animation that shows how this evolves. Um, and I added a couple of tracer particles here, just, it might still be hard to see, but it, it, it's, a, it's easier to see uh, how these are um, behaving, uh, to, to be able to follow them um, uh, during the animation. Um, and then, well, just for fun, there's a the green one, which is, uh, happens to be the particle that has the largest um, average uh, radius of all the particles in that particular halo, at least of the ones that remain with it throughout its evolution. Um, so we're currently at this uh, point in the evolution. This is going to progress to redshift zero. We'll see um, an, a halo that comes in. I'm not sure if I'll be able to pause this. I don't think I can. Um, <clears throat> so there will be a, an incoming halo right here. It's going to merge. Um, it's going to cross the burial radius. You'll see. Uh, you'll see how the scale radius. Um, the burial radius and the scale radius res respond to that. You'll see the, the core of the incoming halo uh, pass through the center and, and splash back and, and settle. And also how that um, is uh, strongly reflected in the, the, uh, the density uh, profile here. Um, and so I'll go ahead and play that. So this is the incoming halo. And so the scale radius is about to jump way up and go through this oscillation as the core moves back and forth and uh, as it settles. <clears throat> and there's a lot to look at, and I know it's not possible to look at everything at once. 
Um, and one thing that I didn't mention is that the coloring of the particles um, is an indication of the time that the particle was accreted onto the halo. So now at the end, you can see a little bit better the, the red particles are ones that were accreted more recently. The bluer ones were accreted uh, earlier on. This is also uh, one plus redshift, this uh, scale here. Um, <clears throat> so I think I've covered most of the main uh, points as far as the, this particular scenario. So basically what's going on is that there is um, a, a, a lot of uh, material that comes in with this new halo. We have a lot of um, uh, high energy material that ends up during the relaxation process settling beyond the virial radius of the halo. It's not necessarily escaping uh, sort of forever, sort of, you know, to infinity sort of thing, but, um, but it is not within the virial radius of the halo. Um, as it was during the merger itself. Um, and so that's basically what we see happening here. Um, and, uh, and, and so this is something that it could, it certainly will be um, something that is affected by the way that you are defining, you know, your, your halo mass and the way that you are um, sort of your, your definition, but it, it does seem to be a, a, a relatively general phenomenon as well. And then also I'll show a similar example for the, the tidal stripping scenario. Um, so this is another uh, different halo that undergoes tidal stripping, which is um, the, the region that is shaded in red um, is the, the portion of the evolution where the tidal force is greater than zero, which basically means that it is sort of actively being stripped, uh, losing mass due to tidal stripping. Um, so as it turns out, um, maybe not surprisingly, uh, especially for halos that have lost a significant amount of mass due to tidal stripping, um, they often were at some prior time subhalos. Um, I don't think I mentioned that uh, this, whole this whole analysis, uh, when selected, when looking at halos at redshift zero, we've only been considering not subhalos, so distinct halos, central halos. Um, but we are not, I mean, we're not. Uh, excluding halos that were previously subhalos, and and that does seem to be the case for a lot of these halos that have lost quite a bit of their mass by redshift zero due to tidal stripping. And so, this halo was a subhalo during this re this uh, time right here, where with the dark purple uh, shading. And what we typically see associated with uh, tidal stripping is um, a decrease in the scale radius, the spin parameter, and the pro Prolateness, so in other words, sphericalization. Um, so again, um, I'll, I'll play another animation here. And the thing to to mostly notice is what the what happens to the the density profile, and uh, also just the top line here. The the bottom one is not relevant. So just the top line, which is the density profile. Um, so basically what we see is that uh, the scale radius uh, decreases um, during while it's uh, undergoing mass loss. And this is because of a steepening of the outer portion of this density profile. It becomes more steep than r to the minus three. Um, in other words, it becomes a poor fit to NFW, um, which sort of artificially forces this low uh, scale radius. So you know, it's not, it's not a, it's not the best uh, way of, it's not a, it doesn't make as much sense to use an NFW profile to describe these kinds of halos, but um, in any case, that's what's going on. And uh, so then as well, once this um, becomes a sub halo, so around right here, uh, we'll see a lot of additional material that appears as this enters a, a larger halo, becomes a sub halo, and then is fairly dramatically uh, stripped during that time and, and, and shortly afterwards uh, while, where all of this outer material <clears throat> essentially is removed. Um, so the halo loses the material on the outer portion and retains all of the, the inner material. And uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but all of these uh, particles which are drawn with open circles rather than the closed circles, dots, uh, the open circles are is stuff that will be uh, removed from the halo, will be stripped away. Um, so we can see that happen. Okay. 
So it's about to become a subhalo. It's entering this high density environment. Um, and it's just getting chomped away at this point. And you can see a separation start to uh, form between the, this outer region and the core, um, which is this more sort of spherical core. Um, and, uh, and if you were paying attention here, you, you were able to, I mean, you can still see that the, uh, there's this increase in the, um, the, the outer slope is, is uh, steeper um, than minus three. So this is maybe something closer to minus four. And, uh, and that is causing this uh, uh, decrease in the scale radius. And so that's, that's mostly what I wanted to say about uh, halo mass loss. Um, I mentioned one other thing briefly, which is um, a paper um, uh, led by Ziago, a student at uh, Columbia University, um, which um, tackled the other question, uh, the other question of the dependence of halo properties on environment, and in this case, looking uh, in particular at cosmic web location but controlling for density. So what I talked about before was how halo properties differ in different density environments, knowing nothing about the actual cosmic web, uh, uh, type of cosmic web structure <clears throat> the halos were in. But what Z did was to look at uh, what are the differences in halo properties for halos that are in um, uh, voids versus filaments versus walls, but that are at the same density. Um, and what he found was that there doesn't appear to be any difference in the distribution of halo properties. So in other words, differences in halo properties in different environments are just due to differences, uh, just due um, to being in different density regions and not due to being in different cosmic web locations, at least for the halo properties that he was looking at, uh, which in this case were specific mass accretion rate, spin parameter, concentration, prolateness, um, scale factor of last major merger and scale factor uh, when the, the, the half mass scale factor of that halo, when it reached half of its uh, uh, final mass, um, which is the same properties uh, we looked at previously. So now I'll jump to the next part. And um, how much time is there approximately? 10 minutes? OK. 10 minutes and then questions or 10 minutes total? Well, oh, OK. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'll go through this quickly then. Um, so this is a completely different project. Um, and here I'm working mostly with uh, Mark Huerta's company in Paris um, and uh, my advisor, Joel, at UCSC and, and Yiching Guo. Um, and what we're trying to do is to use deep learning to identify uh, star forming clumps um, stellar clumps in uh, galaxy images. Um, and so <clears throat> uh, just an example of what we're looking for is uh, here's an image of a galaxy from candles and uh, highlighting these would be the stellar clumps, at least as identified by um, Yi Ching Guo in, in his previous analysis where he's done uh, this. And we're working with him and comparing to his previous analysis to try to um, well to use as, as a baseline. Um, and so this is essentially what we are looking for, what we're trying to be to be able, what we'd like to be able to um, to achieve uh, with this approach. And um, the so why are we looking at clumps in general? Um, uh, well, so they're uh, uh, likely play an important role in, in gal uh, evolution of galaxy structure, um, black hole growth, um, stellar feedback. and Understanding uh, the the properties um, should uh, help us to constrain um, models of, of galaxy evolution, um, and uh, so and I'll just say also the advantage of um, trying to do an approach like this. So Yiching has already done an analysis of clumps and candles, um, but his uh, his uh, method of, of of identifying the, the clumps uh, is is takes a lot more um, time, it takes a lot more resources, and it's uh, limited as far as being able to apply it um, to a large number of galaxies and, uh, and be able to process a lot more data um, using a deep learning approach, be much faster. Um, 
uh, we can pro we can handle a lot of data very quickly, and and so uh, you know this is sort of one of the advantage oops, advantages of of doing this. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just to give you a quick idea of uh, what's going into this model, so what we've done is we need to generate a training set which tells the model basically. Um, it provides a lot of images of galaxies with clumps in them and tells it where are these clumps so that it can figure out how to identify them in uh, images of clumpy galaxies that it has not seen before. And we're doing this very, very simply um, by using, by, this is an example of a, a, a fake galaxy image that we are providing as a training image. Um, it's a simple uh, single component galaxy uh, which has several um, clumps placed on top of that and there's some random uh, prescriptions for how to um, place the clumps and d choose the clump properties and the galaxy properties. Um, but it, overall, it's, it's very simple. And then we also provide uh, a mask image, which just indicates where the locations of these clumps so that the model is able to um, figure out uh, how, to, how to find them. And so what we're using for this um, is a type of convolutional neural network called a UNet. And um, it's a uh, has, uh, it takes a, as input a galaxy image. Um, it follows a sort of traditional um, CNN um, <clears throat> process of, uh, of the contracting path where it uh, reduces the, uh, the galaxy image into a feature vector and then uses an expanding path, um, which is where the, the U part of this comes from, to, uh, to get an output image, um, which will be a, an image of the same size as our input image, but it contains uh, what the model, where the model expects uh, the clumps to be. Um, and so an example of what this looks like, uh, here's two examples um, for uh, test images, similar to images provided, um, images that seen during training, um, but, but, uh, but different examples. So this would be uh, an input image this is the truth of where these clumps actually are. And this is what the model uh, produces as output. So not, not looking at this, um, the model gets this. Um, and as we can see, it's similarly here, input image, truth, and this is the model's result. Um, and so we can see that it, in these, at least in these two cases, it, it does extremely well. And, and generally, it does extremely well. Um, <clears throat> and uh, again, this is just for our, our t training and test set. but um, the, the two measures that we're using to, to evaluate the performance here, purity and completeness. Uh, purity is just uh, looking at how many of the clumps that our model um, predicts are uh, actually uh, correct. I mean, how many of, the, how many of those are, are clumps that are actually um, there in the images that we've provided? And the completeness is how many of the true clumps did, was it able to um, recover. Um, and so for, this, uh, for our test set, for these fake galaxies that we've generated and provided and trained it on and everything, we can see that um, at least in the case where uh, the clumps are not overlapping, um, which is the, the, the small dotted line here uh, and here, the, it almost recover, it recovers essentially all of the clumps and um, and it has very high purity, something like 95 or greater as well, uh, percent. Um, so, so it does this well. But the question then is, OK, so we've shown that we can very well recover clumps from, uh, from our, our fake images of clumpy galaxies. Um, but we don't know. We want to know, is this going to work when we are start looking at candles uh, galaxies, real images of galaxies? Um, and it wasn't obvious that uh, it would be successful necessarily, um, but I'll show you uh, the results that we have uh, that we've been getting. These are just some example images um, from Yi Ching's uh, catalog. So, in particular, we're doing this uh, similar to the way that Yi Ching um, has uh, has done his analysis before, which was a, a clump analysis. He's published several papers on. Um, we're using the same galaxies that he looked at and uh, the same um, uh, filters and, uh, and everything to get a, a close comparison. So first I'll just mention what the, the sort of uh, the overall uh, 
results of, of this comparison have been, uh, at least just looking at uh, whether or not we detect a clump and whether or not he detects uh, clumps. Um, and so we see that the completeness that we're getting, the point to pay attention is basically this top line here, which is um, we've optimized this particular model for clump detection in V-band, uh, which is this line here. And we see that um, for uh, the galaxies that Yiching also detected in V-band, we get about 80% completeness and slightly less than 70% purity. So that means that um, we are getting about 80% of the clumps that Yiching also gets, um, and about <clears throat> um, uh, so, so almost 70% of the um, clumps that we are getting uh, Yiching also gets. So it's not perfect, um, but uh, I think this we think this is good enough, and this also is not taking into consideration the clump luminosity. And when we actually break this down into uh, comparing how well we're doing for clumps that are bright versus dimmer relative to the galaxy, we're, we're very consistent for the brighter clumps, become a little bit less consistent for the fainter clumps. Um, but that, that's uh, within the sort of expected uh, error in performance. So um, things seem to be doing well. So I'll just show a couple of examples of this. Um, and then, uh, and then, uh, and that will be it. <laughs> um, so, so here's, uh, this is all one galaxy, um, in three different filters. So B band on top, uh, B band in the middle, and then I band on the bottom. And, uh, so this one is at redshift 0 0.63. Um, for this particular galaxy, Yiching would have used B band, uh, rest frame UV for this, um, uh, for this galaxy to detect the clumps. Um, the original image is here. The image overlaid uh, showing the locations of the clumps from Yuching's catalog um, is in the second column here. So these are the ones that he detected in these small uh, green circles. There's three of them here. Um, and then and the third column is showing the output image from our model. Um, so what we should, I mean, what, what's actually here is uh, some bright spots that have been, we have run Sextractor on it, and then the Sextractor uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, regions are, are, sh are colored in here. Um, and so in this case, we get three uh, clumps uh, in the same locations here, and, that, and the, the, the fact that they're green indicates that they are in agreement here. We find the same ones that he does. Um, and so, I mean, this example is just, it's one that is consistent. So we have the same result that he does. Uh, we, when we apply this to the other bands, uh, we sometimes will maybe get a couple extra clumps here. In this case, we don't pick these up, but these are not bands that uh, he did his clump detection in. So, um, you know, it's interesting to look at. But um, in fact, this is something that will be advantageous using this new method is uh, being able to do uh, clump detection in many different bands um, easily, uh, which isn't something that uh, Yi Jing uh, did in his analysis. So that will be some uh, some new results we'll be able to get there. And, and one last example is just uh, well, it's uh, you know similar. We can see the detection band in this case is B band redshift slightly less than one, and uh, you know we're getting four of the five that he gets here uh, only because this one gets considered to be one big clump instead of uh, two small clumps, which he has, has two small clumps. But um, so that is, uh, yeah, so I had a visual uh, idea of sort of a comparison between the two methods so far. And so what we'll be doing is now applying this uh, to um, a lot more galaxies and, and looking at um, comparing some of the uh, distributions of clump properties versus galaxy properties and, and et cetera for, uh, for this new method. And uh, also looking at uh, clumps in uh, high resolution hydro simulations uh, as well, and folding that into the analysis as well. So I'll leave up a summary of the, the halo mass uh, portion and, uh, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, the speaker. Uh, questions, comments, suggestions for uh, Christoph. Okay, I'm quite, okay. Sorry, how do you find your exclusion radius? Oh, well, uh, uh, I just picked it. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean, so you're talking about this. Yeah. Uh, all, all this is is just uh, when we give a Galaxy image to the model, it finds all the clumps. I, I don't have, well, yeah, you can see here. So, right, it, it just picks up clumps everywhere. It, it knows, it is actually trained to not to ignore the center, the bulge in the galaxy, and to not identify that as a clump. But uh, we don't, in our training images, we don't have galaxies out here and this kind of stuff, and we're not training it to ignore that stuff. We could, but I, we don't, it's not really necessary because uh, we just, um, well, so uh, Yiching it detects clumps outside of the, uh, the, uh, the radius, the effective radius, uh, the half light radius of the galaxy. Um, and so, um, you know, basically just by choosing some uh, multiple of the, the galaxy radius and uh, only uh, and sort of throwing away any clump that gets uh, discarded outside of that and choosing it such that we have, uh, we're including most of the clumps that Yiching would have included. You know, we don't want to choose uh, too small of a radius because then we're going to be missing clumps that he would have included. So it was just kind of like uh, choosing something that seemed to produce uh, consistency with Yiching's clumps uh, that he had found already. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Irene. I was puzzled by the movies you showed. There is some yeah. oscillation in the. Oh yeah. W what is Let's producing see. that, or is it an error, or what? Say again. The oscillation that yeah. you see in the. Uh, in all the particles moving up and down. Yeah. Let me. Let yeah. Me, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so so are you talking about this oscillation here? Like this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, so this is so I mean, if you follow, uh, you can see some of these tracer particles, the the paths that they're following, and this is this is what their orbits look like, and this is yeah, this is kind of the the orbital. Uh, the, this typical orbital pattern, this is what it looks like in this particular diagram. Um, so they're oscillating between uh, large radius and, and low velocity and, you know, low radius and high velocity. And so the ones that, depending on the energy of the particle you have, they occupy these kind of different uh, paths. And then um, also depending on when they're, when they're accreted, the later accreting ones tend to be on this sort of outer, you know, portion and earlier, you know, from the old, uh, older particles are on the inner part and so on. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, two questions. The first one is related to the criterion you use it to define the density, the over density in the environment. I didn't understand yeah. very well what scales typically are what tracing what? this criterion. Say again. The, the, what's the typical scale that is you are uh, tracing with this criterion, with the density criterion? Is four megaparsec, two megaparsecs? Uh, is the over density the density around the halo? Yeah. Yeah. So, what's the typical scale? The uh, typical is, scale, like the typical density value. Yeah. Or, 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 uh -huh. You are tracing the the environment at what scale with this criterion? Uh huh. Um. <clears throat> Okay, maybe, maybe I'm not sure I fully understand, but uh, so we're using a Gaussian kernel. Yeah, it's Gaussian. Like that. Yeah, that's right, Gaussian smoothing. So what we're doing is uh, for the version where we're counting up dark matter particles and sort of the true, the exact dense dark matter density. Um, so we are uh, smoothing on using a Gaussian kernel um, on many. We've gone from basically one megaparsec smoothing radius all the way up to 16. Um, and we, we're using all those different scales. Um, and then, so we're showing the results uh, for all of those, but then we'll choose uh, scales that are different depending on the halo mass, mm -hmm. just because um, for a lower mass halo, we will, um, and we'll show the different scales. I mean, if I go to the plot, you see the different scales shown there, but we, we choose, uh, what we call the characteristic scale, the one that we like, think is shows the the most interesting dense local density information uh, will be lower smaller for lower mass halos because the halo size is smaller so 
uh, we don't need to go smooth out as far to uh, to get you know far enough away from the halo uh, radius itself. But then for a massive halo, we use a much larger uh, density. So it's smoothing. not uh, the same. It's not the same uh, scale for all the halos. Depends on well, the size be. of the halos. Well, yeah, the, I ask this because you said one of the conclusions is that when you use the filament uh, 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 voids or walls, yeah. there is no effects. There is no uh, clear uh, uh, effects of this large scale environment on the halo, halo properties. Right. But when you use the this kind of density local environment, yeah. you find clear difference. So, right. so this is why I was asking how big is this uh, local? Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Environment. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so definitely uh, big enough. Well, but so it's it, we go like I said, we go both large and and small. So. And the, the trends, basically, when we use, uh, if you use too small of a smoothing scale for the density, then you're not, and you have a large halo, then you're not going, you're not getting the, the nearby environment, you're just getting the halo, right? So you have to use at least some sort of larger density uh, smoothing scale, which is significantly larger than the halo. But okay. the, lar the farther out that you go, you'll still see the, all the same trends. Uh, they will just become... Um, subdued they you know you won't see as much difference once you smooth on larger and larger scales so it it's it's all consistent it's just that we try to use a scale which is big enough that you're not uh just getting the halo itself and you're getting we actually use we make sure that the smoothing scale is at least four times greater than the radius of the halo so that uh and that is sort of the minimum and then from there we go out a bit farther but once you go out too far, then it kind of sort of uh, washes out a bit. Yeah. Good. And my second question is related to, I think you didn't answer Irene's question. Where goes the the particles uh, when, yeah. uh, and, and in more, more general, what's the fraction of unbound particles in the simulation? In the whole simulation? We typically well, think that all particles are in halos, yeah. but what's the fraction of unbound particles? You are finding a lot of these unbound particles after the mergers, the, the loss. Yeah. yeah? Yeah, there. Yeah, there are. Uh, I don't know the total fraction of unbound particles. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so what we haven't done is to actually continue tracking the particles after they have left the halo. Um, it's possible to do, of course. Uh, but uh, so essentially, what what we have been able to see. So what what I can say about what happens to the particles is that you have material that enters the halo, and then. Um, you know, when the when the merging halo enters the main halo, there you have the the peak in the mass because everything is sort of within the viral radius. Uh, but a lot of that is higher energy material, which is not going to uh, remain in that halo. And it um, presumably what is going to happen most of the time is that it's going to sort of settle around the outside of the halo, outside of the viral radius, um, and so it won't be counted in the halo mass. Um, but it will still be in the vicinity uh, of that halo. Um, and what, how much of it is reaccreted later? Maybe a lot of it is. Uh, we did, it's not something that we have quantified. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, according to the first part of your talk, uh, I wonder what is happening in the case of low surface brightness galaxies? Uh, in, in that case, uh, given a stellar mass or a halo mass, you have a, a very large scale structures. Uh, uh, so in that case, the spin must be higher mm -hmm. or they must be formed in uh, high density tidal forces or something like that, right? Hmm. Um, yeah. Um... I yeah I'm not sure yeah that's it's not something uh, uh, that yeah I'm not sure that I I know really yeah <laughs> okay let's thank the speaker again I creo hoy creo que no hay party